What is up, everybody? Thank you for joining us at Candid Truth. We're going to talk about the truth, and we're going to get candid with it. I'm here with my beautiful host, Aubrey, and we're going to be talking about tongues. Mm -hmm. Tongues in the church. What is tongues? What do you think of tongues when you hear tongues? Well, I have an interesting take on that because... I grew up in church the whole time and I did not grow up around the charismatic movement or mm. anything. So it meant to me, I think what you're going to be showing us. And so okay. I'm not going to burst that bubble. Okay. Yeah. I grew up in churches, kind of different churches, uh, Baptist and then charismatic non-denominational churches. I did grow up around tongues by the age of eight or nine. I started seeing um, people speaking in tongues and sometimes there was a translation, sometimes there wasn't, but it was a language that people didn't know. I mean, nobody, nobody heard real audible words and people say it was a language of angels and it's a, it's a gift that you're speaking kind of to the Holy spirit and stuff. So we're going to look at that from the Bible because that's mm -hmm. what we want to talk about on this show. We only, we only want to know what the Bible says mm -hmm. or history or some kind of other evidence, but we don't want to just go with our feelings or emotions, traditions, none of those things. We want to go straight to the source. Mm -hmm. And for this topic, the source is the word of God. We can't go anywhere else on this topic. So let's start with a video clip because um, I, I'm comparing two different things. And you're going to see in this video clip, we're going to compare the gift of tongues in the church and some people in the new age movement. And I want you to think about what are the differences? Is there any difference? And um, yeah, just check it out. Check out this clip right here. And I was guided to come in this place to do this transmission. This is Lemuria light language and sound activation and you will know if this is the message for you many of us had lifetimes together as a soul group as a soul family on Lemuria ah, Oh, for the time has come to ha se ku and ha se bo and a mu shikila basitu and ali mu reke and o tu la majide kruti izino lo mu revi shikila pose. What I've seen with my clients in the past is that some people actually do give their consent in the dream time. Uh, you know, they're traveling, astral traveling, and. Um, may encounter beings that appear to be something else than what they really are and so you might think you are communicating with some angelic being or whatever and actually it's something else Angelic forces, angelic reinforcement, angelic reinforcement, angelic reinforcement. Vika hata anda ata ora bata rata ande eke eke manda rasa. So I didn't see anything different. Uh, it was comparing new age light language, this is what they call it, mm -hmm. versus uh, people in the church. And I think if you, you know, use just audio and removed any kind of Christianese, such as hallelujah or in Jesus name, mm -hmm. and you just heard the speaking back to back, you would not be able to tell the difference whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering why, why not? Because God's not the author of confu uh, confusion mm -hmm. and to me, that's confusing just listening to it. I don't know what's being said. Um, it sounds like something that I hear coming from the New Age world. So that's confusing to me. Why would this be in the church if it's in the New Age world? And this is what is called light language. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to show you a couple clips, not clips. I'm going to show you a couple of uh, 
comments that were on these YouTube channels of people speaking in light language. Sorry, the, the screenshot's so blurry. I don't know what happened to it, but I can make out some of it. And, and one of them says, I'm not sure how I found this, but my chest felt super heavy. Most of, most of this, them around 14 minutes. Tears. Wow. Powerful. Thank you. Someone else says, why do I feel like I was a mermaid? And this is how I spoke to people I cared about. Um, and so you know, those other ones, the last one says, when you start channeling and guardians, I just burst into tears. Much love. So, you know, people are saying that when they hear this new ager speaking in light language, that's un, it's not an, it's an unknown language. Mm -hmm. People are literally getting emotional. They're saying, I burst into tears. My chest felt heavy. Why do I feel like this was the way I spoke to people I loved? So the reason I'm bringing this up is because so many people will say, no, when I speak in tongues, I feel it. Right. I, it can't be of the devil because it makes me feel so good. And I have these euphoric feelings and all this. This is a, a misconception that we have in the Christian church is that Satan can't make you feel good. Mm -hmm. They're like, he's the, he's the author of destruction. He's only here to seek, kill and destroy. And he can't make you feel good. That's a lie. I can take an ecstasy pill and I can feel really good. Mm -hmm. That's not of God. Right. Uh, people who are in the new age movement, they meditate, they channel, they, it's all love and light and ooh, and it changes people's lives. It's not of God. So I have something to say on that because almost everything in this world that's a counterfeit, like drugs mm -hmm. and alcohol and all these things, they do make you feel good. Yeah. They're pleasurable. So Satan's always having a pleasurable counterfeit, even if it is tongues. That's right. I mean, yeah. Yeah, and so that's, that's kind of the go-to answer that most people have is like, well, Satan counterfeits everything, and so this is really of God, but he has a counterfeit that's so close, you can't even tell the difference. Um, so we're going to look, we're going to look at what does the scripture say about tongues? Because just to let you know, I do believe in the gift of tongues. Mm -hmm. It's in the Bible. Mm -hmm. The apostles had it. However, well, I'm just going to link what I had just come to mind mm -hmm. on the fact that Satan can give you pleasure as well. Because when you are in church and they're playing certain songs that are way too, um, like, I don't know, emotional. Yeah. It's usually getting your emotions high strung right. on purpose. It's a mob mentality that they're invoking with the music. Mm -hmm. And it's also counterfeit. That's not the Holy Spirit. Right. That is demonic. Yeah. And that's that's a good example because you can take the music, the instrumentals of a Hillsong mm -hmm. song, which I like that music. Mm -hmm. But and I know that, you know, it's controversial because some of these people, they're not, what I'm saying is the music sounds good to me and, and the words, I can feel like I'm singing that to God and I can get touched and emotion and even cry and all that stuff. And, but the thing I'm saying is you can take the same soundtrack mm -hmm. and you could say, Lucifer, you are beautiful and you will get goosebumps and yep. you will cry and you'll get all the same emotions, mm -hmm. the good feeling, because it's the music, it's the emotion of the music. Music has emotion to it. You mm -hmm. can play the soundtrack of a horror movie for a three-year-old kid that's never been exposed to a horror movie at all, and they will get fearful. They'll grab mm -hmm. their mother's leg. They're scared because there's a spirit attached to certain types of music. In fact, if even if they don't know English yet. Yeah, you don't have to. Even, uh, there's no words. Exactly. You don't yeah. even have to understand what's being said. Right, because a lot of times that's the that's what people say, too music is based on the lyrics you can have christian metal or you can have satanic metal mm. and it just matters what the words are saying but Not metal true. music the spirit that comes with that the emotion that comes attached to that sound is rage uh it, it's anger it's not peace love joy all these fruits of the spirits mm -hmm. and so you can't mix and match you can't say oh, i love jesus like that music is making you want to uh slam dance and bang your head mm -hmm. and that's not something that you learn from culture that's just what the music makes you do right you, you play some pop music and people just they start moving and, and grooving with it they don't have to be taught to do that that's mm -hmm. the music making you move yeah so we're going to go through and look at some scriptures here but first i want to show you that 
in the New Age world, they call this star language. So what does a star represent in the Bible? An angel. Mm -hmm. In the book of Revelation, it says that the dragon uh, grabbed a third of the stars and cast them to the earth. Stars are angels. So this is literally saying angel language. But remember, there's good and bad angels. So angel angel language doesn't just mean good language. Mm -hmm. And then the next one says light language. And you can think, oh, light. That's good, right? But Lucifer was an angel of light. That's mm -hmm. what his name literally meant. So light language. And then down here it says dragon language. So it seems like it's starting to get even more in your face that this is serpent language. This is dragon language. And I just wanted to show that that's what they call it. But let's look in Genesis 10, 5. It says, by these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue, after their families in their nations. So in the Bible, the word tongues means language. From Genesis to Revelation, that's Old Testament, always to the New Testament as you can get. Revelation 14, 6, it says, To preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So this word, tongues, that we, we keep hearing and we're trying to figure out what is this that's in the church. In the Bible, it simply meant language. Because mm -hmm. it says every tongue and nation. And that's what I grew up with. It's not... Uh, gibberish yeah. or some kind of language of light or angelic language that you're speaking it was mm. actually known that it was demonic yeah um i grew up knowing that and so when tongues is mentioned in the bible we also knew that it meant that you were endowed by the holy spirit all of a sudden to speak another language to reach those in the audience that speak like arabic yeah. or swahili and in the Bible, it even has where they were endowed with the gift all at once yeah. with many of the apostles speaking at once. And it's like translation was happening in a second with everyone understanding. And yes. And it was understood. So the gift, a real supernatural gift would be if I was uh, giving a sermon somewhere. And like you said, some Arabic dude came in the back and he doesn't know a lick of English. But at the end of the sermon, he says what you said or you know, maybe he can't speak it, but a translator tells him or something that uh, what you said was amazing. And I'm like, how'd you understand? And he'd right. be like, well, I heard it in my own language. And yeah. I'd be like, well, I was speaking English. So that'd be a supernatural thing. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I've actually heard a story, uh, a true story of a pastor that was going into hospitals every week and he would go room to room. And one day he went into a room and there was a Spanish guy, a Hispanic guy dying on his deathbed. And this pastor didn't know anything but English. Mm. And he went in there and he was asking the guy if he knew God. And he was, you know, this dude was about to die. Mm -hmm. And so he was leading him to the Lord and he died in front of him. The guy accepted Christ. He led him to the Lord, led him to the Lord. And um, he told the nurse to come in and she said, did you know him? He said, no, I'm just a pastor. And she said, well, this guy didn't know a single word of English. He didn't know any English, but in that last, that dude's final moments, God gifted him the gift of tongues to be able to speak to this man in a language he understood, and he yeah. led him to the Lord. That's a true gift. Uh -huh. Standing up in church and saying, that doesn't edify anybody. And we're going to see verses that say exactly that. Mm -hmm. And so it seems harsh to say speaking in gibberish in church is demonic, but it's it's not biblical it's not what the bible says and we're going to find out we're, stick with me we're going to find out from the scriptures alone exactly what the gift of tongues is this isn't just one example we're giving so first corinthians 14 2 says for he that speaketh in an unknown tongue see oh it's unknown speaketh not unto men but unto god for no man understands him so right here it sounds like well, maybe this is, maybe it's some kind of unknown tongue. Mysterious language, yeah. Yeah, like an angelic tongue. But but unknown just means unknown to the people in the audience Around or maybe you. even yourself. Because if I started speaking Spanish all of a sudden, that's an unknown tongue to me. Right. If I start, but it says, speaketh not unto men, but unto God. So here's a scenario. Let's, let's read this again. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue... Speaketh not unto men, but unto God, for no man understands it. 
So if I went into a Hispanic church and nobody there spoke English and I'm in the back saying, praise God, I love you so much. They're going to turn around and look at me and I'm speaking in an unknown tongue. Mm -hmm. Am I speaking to them? No, because they don't understand it. It says I'm speaking to God. Mm -hmm. Only he understands. Mm -hmm. So this, we're going to get more context about this because it actually tells you don't do that. Mm -hmm. It says if you're speaking in an unknown tongue, you're really a distraction mm -hmm. in the church. Huh. So 1 Corinthians 14, five, uh, 4 through 5 says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, because nobody else can hear. Nobody else knows what you're saying, so you're really only edifying yourself, right? Well, and I think of it, and uh, forgive me for saying so, but I'm going to be very candid. That's what mm, we're doing here. That's right. When I've heard people speak in tongues, I do think it's... Um, an ego trip they're trying to serve themselves mm. most of the time because it is it's like i am wholly chosen of god and now i'm going to showcase this yeah because when the bible talks about giving the gift of tongues it's it's to reach the world but if you're in church and you're speaking in gibberish in the back and nobody understands what you're saying mm -hmm. you're just showing off somehow yeah it's not really who are you really helping yeah so here it says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Mm -hmm. I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. So what he's saying is, he's saying, you know what, the gift of tongues is a great gift, but I'd rather that you all prophesied. And he's like, unless there's an interpreter in the church, because if there's an interpreter, then you're edifying the church and not yourself. Mm -hmm. So basically what Paul is saying is, if you're speaking in gibberish, you're not edifying anyone but yourself because nobody understands it. And then it says in 1 Corinthians 14, 9 through 11, it says, Except ye utter by the tongue words easy to, un easy to be understood. These words that we, these gibberish that we just saw in this clip are not easy to be understood. How shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Signific signification. Yep, signification. Therefore, if I know not that the meaning of the voice... I shall be unto them that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. Mm -hmm. So he's literally saying, look, if you're speaking something that's uh, not easy to understand, you're just speaking to the air and you're speaking like a bunch of voices and you're speaking like a barbarian. Can I add something to that that please. really just popped into my mind? Yeah, please. Satan is the prince of the air. Oh, yeah, exactly. You're speaking in the air. And he's the author of confusion. Yes. And so when we're speaking at something that's unknown, like a barbarian, that's that doesn't edify anybody. This is from the Word of God. This isn't a personal opinion of ours. This is why we're talking so candidly. This show is about learning truth together. Yeah. We don't have all the answers. We want to hear from you. If you got, um, you know, some kind of input, put it in the comments. If you have recommendations we want to know them we want to talk about topics that people need answers on and we want to find out together we want to mm -hmm. study stuff out together um i was going to add to that that i guess what i was saying is that it seems as though they're just making a spectacle of themselves on purpose mm -hmm. um kind of like a humble martyr how oh, yeah. how do you a martyr really wouldn't be making a spectacle of themselves on purpose just right. to be praised. That would be really messed up. So it kind of sounds like that. That is. So 1 Corinthians 14, 7 through 19. We're just continuing. This is all 1 Corinthians 14. And it says, For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God. I speak with tongues more than ye all. Yet... In the church, I had rather speak five words with my understanding than by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. Yeah. So notice he's saying, look, 
I'd rather speak five words that are understood than 10,000 and unknown. That is like nail in the coffin right there. Mm. For anyone that stands up in church and, and speaking like this, you're really not edifying anybody. You're not, this isn't what Paul wanted. Moving on, it, it continues, it says, If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. So again, look. I want to leave this on the screen so you can read it for yourself. Again, the scenario, if I stepped in, to a Hispanic church and I'm in the back saying, Oh God is so good. And you changed, you changed my life. There's no interpreter in that room. He's saying, keep it to yourself. You're not edifying. You're actually a distraction. And he's saying, if there's, if there's not a, a Spanish or an English to Spanish translator, speak to yourself and to God, mm-hmm. I can be back there and I can say, God, you're so good. You know, and I, and I'm, not distracting. I'm not, you know, because I'm speaking some unknown tongue. And where it says, let it be by two or at most by three, that's saying, you know, sometimes we go to these events where there's a mixed crowd. Maybe we go to Guatemala and there's some that speak Spanish and some that speak Portuguese. And maybe for some reason there's some that speak French or something. Let's just say, for example, and if I'm up there giving a presentation it says, let them not let them speak by two or three at the most. So I say something, the Spanish man translates, the Portuguese man translates, and then the French man translates, don't do any more because it's going to take too long. It already mm-hmm. takes, you know, if I go, like I went to Bolivia recently, and my, all my presentations, I had to shrink them down to like half time because... Usually I I expect to have an hour's worth of time. Mm -hmm. But when I say something and I have to wait for the translator to say exactly what I said, but in Spanish, and then it's my turn again, that takes half of my time. Now I got 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. So imagine if there's two or three translations going on, this is going to take all day just to get your message across. So the Bible is is giving you guidelines. If you're going to be speaking in tongues, have a translator, but don't have more than two or three at most so i'll add and like forgive me for the comparison but we see people who are struggling like on the streets homeless people speaking to themselves all the time Mm, and in my estimation most of it doesn't ever make sense and they are just speaking gibberish yeah i've definitely heard that now how much more do we we, we look more intelligent because usually they're strung out, unfortunately, on yeah. drugs or they're drunk, um, which Satan uses to channel yeah, through you even exactly. as well. But how much more in some ways kind of in, insane or out of your mind do you look in church doing that? Yeah. It looks similar. Yeah, exactly. You know, what would people on the outside, you're trying to witness to somebody who doesn't know anything about the Bible, doesn't know anything about God or Jesus, Mm -hmm. and you're wanting to be a good representation of Christ. You love them like Christ, and and then you finally get them to step foot in your church. Yeah. And now it looks like this church is insane because people are just screaming. And we're just talking about tongues, but it goes as far as to where people are like, ah, twitching and barking like dogs and everything. I've seen all that. It happens in Kenneth Copeland churches and Benny Hinn and all that. Right. And that is the Kundalini spirit. When you see that, um, when people are twitching like that, that's called Kriyas. And this is what happens when people are practicing Kundalini yoga. They're trying to, they're inviting the serpent from their base chakra, which is near the tailbone, and they're inviting it to their crown chakra. That's the main goal. Inviting the serpent to your brain. Think about that with biblical lenses. You're inviting Satan into your mind. And when you finally reach that place, the that's the top, you know. Yeah. People start getting these involuntary twitches and kriyas, and they think that that's a good thing. Like, wow, we finally like I I'm on some new level and I I talk to entities and 
ascended masters and all these things. Will you be getting more into that? Probably not. Okay. So I did a study on this. Mm -hmm. I won't be sharing that, but what I came out understanding is that usually when you study like these prophets and apostles who were in vision, mm. there's a, there's a certain um, direction in which someone falls when they are supposedly speaking in tongues and they get pushed back. Oh yeah. Um, they get pushed down. Right. And the convulsions right. and stuff. Yeah. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you in the Bible, they fell on their faces mm, to worship that's God. A good point. And so prostrate, prostrate. And they didn't flail and they didn't yeah. a, a seize or anything. It was just majesty and glory. Yeah. They were humbled. They were undone. Yeah. And I've never seen the Bible say that somebody got slain in the spirit unless no. it was an angel that literally slew men. Right. And it killed them. Right. And that's not good. Why would we why would we go to church to get slain mm -hmm. by an angel? Right. Uh, yeah. so this is this just shows you that Satan has really infiltrated the church. First, he's twisted all the doctrines. You got the pre trib rapture and you got all these different things, denominations and mm -hmm. uh, even the Sun Sunday church all started with paganism when God said, remember the Sabbath day. So already there's so much twisted doctrines and then you invite speaking in gibberish, light language, and then it turns into Kriyas and the Kundalini and everything and being slain in the spirit, being drunk in the spirit. The Bible says, be not drunk on wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say be drunk with the Holy Spirit. Drunk is bad. Yeah. Anytime you find the word drunk in the Bible, it's drunkards will not inherit the kingdom. You know, this person went into the holy temple drunk and they dropped dead. Like drunk is never good in the Bible. Whenever you're out of your mind, basically, yeah. or consciousness, it's it's really I have to clarify that because in some people I truly believe were given visions mm -hmm. and they Probably didn't look like they were home during that moment. Right. Um, but when you do have flailing and running around and, and swinging off chandeliers, you got yeah. everyone lining up to do kind of look like mad people, yeah. mad men. <laughs> um, there's a difference. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Like you have to consider. What's one of the fruits of the spirits? Self-control. Self-control. When you're running around ah, like, a, yeah. like an animal and barking like a dog and flailing, that's yeah. not self-control. That's the opposite of self-control. Right. That's possession. And you always know them by their fruits. That's what the Bible tells us, right? Yeah. The fruits of the Spirit. Yeah. So peace, joy, love, self-control, all these things mm -hmm. are not being displayed when, when it comes to that movement. Right. But let's get back to the tongues issue because this is what we really are, are talking about. Mm -hmm. And so it continues and it says, for God is, oh my goodness, it's right here. I didn't know this is the verse. <laughs> For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, yes. as in all churches of the saints. I've been saying this, God's not the author of confusion, not even realizing that it was part of this uh, mm -hmm. presentation. Mm -hmm. I made this presentation a couple years ago, and I forgot that it was actually in this context. But yeah, so when God says he's not the author of confusion, Paul is, is using that in the context of tongues. Mm -hmm. And he's saying, look, if you speak in an unknown tongues, you're a distraction, you sound like a barbarian, and you're confusing. Mm -hmm. It goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 13, 1, it says, Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. So this is what people will say. They'll say, look, it's the tongue of angels. I want to ask you a question. When... An angel came and spoke to Daniel. Did he speak in gibberish? No. And Daniel was like, oh, I, I understand it all. I mean, no. I'll get an interpreter, yeah. yeah. Guess what? Angels have the gift of tongues. Yeah. Because the gift of tongues is speaking your language. So if that's heaven's definition of speaking in tongues, then why not the Bible and why not our understanding of it? Right. If an angel presented himself to me, he'd be speaking in English. If a Bible presents itself to Daniel, mm -hmm. he's speaking in Aramaic or Hebrew. If an angel presents himself to somebody in China, he's speaking Chinese mm -hmm. because the angel has the gift of tongues. Right. 
the angel's not speaking in gibberish. So when we get to this right here, I want, I want to show in the concordance, it says, though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels. And people say, look, I'm speaking with the tongue of angels. Mm. But what is this word? It's G32. G32 means Greek 32. And if you look in a concordance, it'll give you the Greek definition because sometimes our English translation, we don't have a, a good word or it'd be too lengthy or whatever. So we just, for, for an example, the word that's hell in the Bible, it's really four words in, in Greek and Hebrew. It's um, Gehenna, Sheol, Hades, and Tartarus. Those words end up just being hell in the Bible, in the English Bible. Hmm. So when you see this word angels, let's look at it in the Greek, um, G32. And it says angelos. And the angelos says an angel or a messenger and then it says usage a messenger generally a supernatural messenger from god an angel conveying news or behest from god to men but then it says property properly a messenger or delegate either human or heavenly and when you look at this word when you look up this word and find out all the places that it's used in the Bible, you will actually see that that word is used for a preacher. It actually says, but it'll say preacher. In the English Bible, it'll say preacher. But if you look in the concordance, what word was that? It's this G32, I think. Yeah, G32. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Angelos. Because that preacher is a messenger. We're called to be messengers. And so when it says, though I speak with the tongue of men and of angelos or messengers, mm -hmm. Paul is simply saying, though I speak with the tongue of men's or as eloquent as an angel or as eloquent as a pastor, as eloquent as somebody who has the gift of speaking. He's saying, though I speak with the tongue of men or if I speak as eloquent as an angel, if I don't have love, it's not worth anything. Right. That was the whole point. It had right. nothing to do with, by the way, there's a tongue of angels and it's a, it's a unknown tongue yeah. to all men, which is gibberish. And is not edifying to anybody was what Paul's saying. God doesn't speak in mysteries. Yeah, exactly. He speaks to you in a in a known tongue, in your known tongue. Mm -hmm. So Babel, and the, this is the Tower of Babel in the Bible. And it says the definition: a city in Shinar where the building of a tower is held in Genesis to have been halted by the confusion of tongues. When you talk in gibberish, you're talking in Babel. And the word Babel came from the Tower of Babel. It's what babies talk in. And notice it says, a confusion of sound or voices, a scene of noise or confusion. So we're literally bringing Babel into the church. Mm -hmm. We're bringing confusion, Babel, uh, unknown tongue, gibberish, into the church. And this is what the Bible says when you read prophecy. It talks about come out of Babylon, mm -hmm. come out of Babylon. That word baby in there, baby comes from uh, not, not having understanding. Baby talk, you know, goo goo gaga, gibberish is Babel. That's what babies speak in Babel. And when God punished that city, he, he made a bunch of different tongues. Mm -hmm. He gave them all different tongues and now we have all these different tongues because God created them. Mm -hmm. And the gift of tongues is to be able to speak in each of those tongues. Right. It's not a, it's not an unknown language. So Revelation 18, 3 and 4 says, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are wax rich, through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that they may, that they be not partakers of her sins and that ye receive not of her plagues. This is a plea from God saying, look, there, her is a church. When you see that word her that's underlined, her is a, is a church. And there's two church, there's two women in the book of Revelation, the pure woman, and the harlot and the pure woman is God's people. Remember, the church is not a building; it's it's a body of people. And God has His people, which is represented by the pure woman. And then there's this other 
poor. There's this harlot church that has invited doctrines of demons into the church. Confusion. That's why it says drunk. This harlot is drunk with confusion, but God is saying, look, you may be in that church. You may be in that church that's speaking Babel, that's literally bringing Babylon into the church, but come out of her. Mm -hmm. And he's calling them his people because God has people in all denominations and all churches. But he's saying in these last days, you must come out of her because I'm going to pour my wrath upon the earth. And I don't want you to partake of those plagues. Please come out of her, my people. And so this is God's plea for us to, to escape the wrath to come out of these false teachings that are literally doctrines of demons. Mm -hmm. Did you have any other things to say? No. I hope this was edifying. I hope it made sense. I hope it was clear because I wasn't speaking in gibberish. Um, if you speak another language, I hope that this is translated by Google and they can be shared with the world because we want the message to go out to the ends of the world. And we want our words to be clear and understood and not to be gibberish, not to sound like a barbarian. We want everyone to be edified. And so if you were blessed by this, if it made sense, give it a thumbs up. Please share this with people that you know are struggling with these things. And if you're, you're new to this channel, click subscribe because we come out with videos like this all the time. And it's only because of you that we can even do this. Mm -hmm. We actually stepped away and in faith, we're doing what God's called us to do. We're starting our own ministry. If you would like to support this ministry, you can do so by going to some of these um, different digital ways to give. We have Cash App at uh, dollar sign Candid Truth Official. We have Venmo, and you can do at Mikey Jenny, which is my name. And at Zelle, you can give to executebrand at gmail.com. We also have a donate button on candidtruth.org. If you click that, it'll allow you to donate to us through PayPal. So we have many different ways that you can donate. If you would like to wear a t-shirt with our logo on it, that helps support us as well. And we have a Teespring that's connected on our website. Mm -hmm. So we love you. We thank you for being with us. We hope that you were blessed by this and we uh, give, us a, give us some comments. We want to know what you think. And give us some more verses. If you think you can prove that we should talk in gibberish, give us the verses. We want to get it from the Bible and the Bible alone. Mm -hmm. We love you. God bless. And we'll see you next time on Candid Truth.